So belief becomes biology. And if that doesn't run maybe a little shiver down your spine, you haven't heard it. Belief becomes biology. That's huge. Right? How often, how many negative beliefs might we have, right? Tremendous. So belief and intent affect biology, um, both negatively and positively. And where we place our attention is everything. Again, thinking of attention as an actual energetic flow that has consequences is very, very valuable. And a new way of thinking for most of us. So I'm going to go through a few examples. The nocebo effect. In Latin, I shall harm. So there was a study done showing that when the side effects of a medication were explained to a patient who was receiving a placebo, some patients would manifest those side effects. Some so severely, they would leave the study. Another study showed that verbal suggestions can increase pain sensitivity. It had to do with doctors administering um, tests with patients. Um, depending on how they described the test that they were doing, the patient would have increased pain sensitivity or decreased pain sensitivity. This is going to hurt. It didn't help too much. <laughs> and this is fascinating. Prognoses can cause death. That is something. There were studies that have been done. Um, a doctor in Sydney Hospital has been focusing on this. His name is Dr. Milton. Um, had done a lot of studying on the impact of the delivery of a prognosis. And I want to quote him here. There is a small group of patients in whom the realization of impending death is a blow so terrible that they are quite unable to adjust to it. And they die rapidly before the malignancy seems to have developed enough to cause death. The problem of self-willed death is in some ways analogous to the death produced in primitive peoples by witchcraft, by pointing the bone, all of those. There are certain primitive tribes who have ways of um, kind of excommunicating people from their uh, groups. And very often, the folks go off and they're dead a couple days later. Placebo effect. I'm going through just one experiment because honestly, the placebo effect I mean, our, our bookshelves are saturated, right, with examples of the placebo effect. Me much research is out there. I really encourage you to explore that. Um, the New England Journal of Medicine published a really compelling study. They actually did a placebo effect on surgery, on surgery. There were three groups. One group had the full surgery for osteoarthritis, so removing bits of cartilage that had gotten in the way of the joint. Another group did not have any of the cartilage removed, but simply had the joint um, flushed, which can sometimes aid in, in reducing inflammation. The placebo group got a fake surgery. It lasted the exact same time. It was 40 minutes. Uh, <laughs> the surgeon even splashed salt water to mimic the sound of the flushing of the joint. So the patient, because you know we're in kind of a twilight um, uh, phase of consciousness, they were aware. And they had the water splashed to make it seem really real. Uh, the placebo group improved just as much as the other groups, just as much. The lead surgeon and um, principal investigator, Dr. Bruce Mosley, my, skin, my skill excuse me, as a surgeon had no benefit on these patients. The entire benefit of the surgery for osteoarthritis of the knee was the placebo effect. It's about $40,000, I think, down the tube, something like that, right? And I have a really fascinating quote. One of the um, participants who received the placebo, his name was Tim Perez, was using a cane, but after the surgery, now plays basketball with his grandchildren. He told the Discovery Health Channel, in this world, anything is possible when you put your mind to it. I know that your mind can work miracles. So the placebo effect and the nocebo effect, in a sense, were both unconscious, right? The, these folks just really believed that's what was going on. Um, they had those uh, negative or positive expectations. What happens when we actually try to control our expectations? Or what happens when we actually consciously look to see if we can control or manipulate our bodies in a positive or negative way, hopefully a positive way? Well, 
There's a fascinating study that had folks send intention to red blood cells. So all of the participants had their blood drawn. The um, blood was put into 20 test tubes. And the test tubes were put into saline solution, or the blood was mixed with saline solution, which destroys blood cells in about 30 days. It's um, expected. Um, half of the group, or excuse me, the group, the whole group, was asked to send protection in the form of imagery and verbal language um, to 10 of the test tubes. Where all the test tubes were put in another room, so, um, separated from them. And they found that the rate of um, destruction or breakdown of the vials of blood that were protected was much longer, it took more like 50 days compared to 30 days for them to be destroyed. What was interesting is that um, there was a slight, it was very slight, but there was slight um, increased effect when it was the person's own blood that they were sending that protection to. In, along the same lines, we've been talking about me sending intention to parts of our body. Um, and increasing our health. What about our genes? It's a couple levels deeper. There's a whole field now called epigenetics. Has anybody heard of epigenetics? Anybody? Yeah. So the um, intentions first, outcomes second. Um, the premise of, ep of um, epigenetics is that genes can't choose to turn themselves on and express themselves. They rely on an external influence, whether or not they get expressed. We have many, many genes in our bodies that, have, that won't be expressed and aren't expressed. So what is it that makes some genes come for expression and other genes not be expressed? Um, in a heart math experiment, intention is, um, has been said to affect gene expression. In a heart math experiment, Institute for Heart Math, I'll share more about that when we close, um, people were asked to generate feelings of love and appreciation while holding a specific intention to either wind or unwind the DNA in an experimental sample. In some cases, there was a change of 25% in the, conforma the conformation, conformation excuse me, of the DNA, indicating a large effect Similar effects occurred whether the intention was to wind them or unwind them. When the participants had no intention of changing the DNA, yet generated the same feelings, the DNA changed no more than it did with the control group. That's one of many studies. Um, if you're interested in this field at all, highly recommend The Genie in Our Genes, Epigenetics, Medicine, and the New Biology of Intention um, by Dawson Church. Amazing, amazing read. I can't possibly quote all of the remarkable studies um, here that he has, has in there. So belief becomes biology. A quote from him here. As well as beings of matter, we are beings of energy. Electromagnetic shifts accompany virtu virtually every biological process. The energy flowing in, around, and out of neurons and genes interacts constantly with the outside environment. <coughs> genes are how organisms store information, while energy is how they communicate information. And again, this is all about relationship, interconnectedness. Researching genes without looking at the energy component of DNA is like studying a computer hard drive without plugging in the power cable. Several studies also show that what one thinks about one's health is the most accurate predictor of longevity. So attend, attend to what's going on up there. So we've been talking about um, the mystery of energetics, of uh, communication and intention, that intention and belief affect matter, which certainly implies that it can transcend time that precognition study, and even space. But what if consciousness itself exists beyond our physical brains and our hearts altogether? So this is where it gets a little far out. So bear with me. Again, it's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be fun tonight. We are going right into near-death experiences, folks. Consciousness without the brain 
Is that possible? So near-death experiences are often explained away or explained by cell death in the brain. So when death occurs, um, generally the heart has stopped, but the brain is alive. And so the supposition is while all of those neurons, almost like you can imagine the nebula of a star, right, in the kind of death throes, there's lots of activity that can create feelings of uh, visions and all kinds of um, phenomena that folks with NDEs describe. It was certainly considered impossible that anyone could have an experience with a brain that had no activity. Enter Dr. Evan Alexander. So he's a Harvard neurosurgeon, very, very pedigreed, um, which is, I think, one of the things that gives his story so much relevance. Um, very respected um, neurosurgeon. He caught a very rare case of bacterial meningitis that should have killed him. During his coma, his brain registered no activity. His doctors said that his brain was, quote, decimated and soaking in pus. Sorry for the um, kind of totally gross image there, but it gets the point across, doesn't it? Things were not looking good for our doctor here. The thing is, he awoke with these impeccable recollections of very, very vivid visual experiences, vivid emotional experiences, and his memory of this whole experience never left him. Very, very detailed. And the point here is that he had memory. His hippocampus was shot. There was no memory capable in his brain. It wasn't possible. He had visions, visual cortex, non-existent. So the fact that he had, that he was able to have experience, which is what we're wondering, is that what consciousness is? Whether he was able to have experience with no brain activity. What does that mean? What does that mean? So is this where science and spirituality meet? You know, we're talking about consciousness independent of physical form, an awareness that transcends our limited human bodies while also suffusing it and animating it. It does sound like many people's ideas of spirit. I came across a beautiful phrase the other day, as in all light, so in all forms. As in all light, so in all forms. As in all energy, so, so in all matter. Potentially. It's a beautiful um, inquiry for the heart. So the upshot, why should I care about this emerging science? What am I doing here on a Thursday evening? We are generally thought, taught to think of ourselves as separate entities because our physical bodies create visible boundaries, right? Very, I mean, it's so obvious we don't think about it. I'm here, you're there, separate. But at a fundamental level, this is not necessarily the case. This field of energy and information exchange is constantly at work within and among us. Each one of us is like a radio transmitter. Again, remember putting your attention to the front of the room, the back of the room. That thing that you're working with is a thing. It's palpable. It has power sending our thoughts and beliefs out into the collective consciousness. So why not do so consciously? If we know that our inner experience actually affects the whole in some very mysterious way, take, it, take advantage of it. What does that exploration look like? That can be a real pivot point for a life to see through those eyes. And I, I had to include this. <laughs> if you doubt the tremendous amount of negativity in our collective human mind, watch the news. <laughs> can't do it myself. So what can I do with this information? So here, here we get a little practical. Uh, recognize that your thoughts and your beliefs have great power, great, great power to affect your life and the world around you. And take responsibility for your state of consciousness. What do they say with great power comes great responsibility? It sounds a, a bit magnanimous, you know, but um, who are we to have that? Well, we're conscious beings. That's who we are. We need to stand in that. We affect everyone and everything around us in ways we cannot fully comprehend. Eckhart Tolle, the wonderful uh, teacher, wrote The Power of Now. Beautiful advice here. Be the ever alert guardian of your inner space. 
Isn't that beautiful? Spend time in quiet every day can be helpful. And meditate in a way that resonates with you. This is so important. Read the mystics. That's how you're hooked up. Explore contemporary wisdom teachers on YouTube. That may sound crazy, but it is an amazing resource. Everybody's on there, the whole gang. Um, of pretty much every tradition you could think of, including the tradition of science. And I have here, if spirituality per se, not so much your thing, enter through the realm of science. It will get you to the same place. Uh, and try an MBSR course. They're wonderful gateways. Uh, spend contemplative time with like-minded people in community, that connection, um, that loving connection with folks who are exploring similar principles in their lives. Very powerful. It sounds so simple. Do what you love. Life's too short. We tend to have this idea that in order to succeed and all of that, uh, we have to live by somebody else's rules and follow a grind and life has to be hard and effortful. Um, it's just our brain says that. And our brain says that because what? It's what we're around. We're in the DC area. You know? <laughs> but not only that, there's a, collective, there's a collective intention that's always affecting us, right? So. Do what you love. Just one moment at a time. That doesn't need to be a big career change. Just in this moment, do what you love. Moment at a time. And when you notice, great, I have time for this. When you notice negative thoughts and beliefs within you, you can change them. You can change them. This is probably my favorite. I'm kind of a dork. This is sort of my favorite slide. You guys ready? I couldn't help myself. <laughs> Any Saturday Night Live fans here, like from the 90s? OK. I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and God, doggone it, people like me. Stuart Smalley. So there was a gag on Saturday Night Live for doing affirmations. This was the character's thing. Affirmations, very, very powerful. So the principle of affirmations, be willing to play with your beliefs. Take them less seriously. Try new ones on. It's not the kind of thing we think about. We tend to think, no, no, no. If I'm going to be a strong person, I need to commit to my beliefs. Well, great, but do it consciously, not because you were taught it from some, somewhere outside you. For example, here's an idea of an affirmation. If there's a negative belief, what's sometimes called a limiting belief, it's a tough world out there. I have to struggle to get what I need. I can probably assure you that beliefs like this are not conscious. It's not like we walk around saying it's a tough world. It, but it's what we're acting from. There's an old belief pattern that this is how the world is. And it takes some awareness, that's what meditation practice is about, to say, wow, I didn't even realize that's been running my whole life, that belief system. Is it true? That's what ma mindfulness does. We change that. All my needs are met effortlessly, life takes care of me, and I can relax. And if you don't get pushback, on that from your system, you haven't gone deep enough, because you will. If this is a belief pattern that you've been living with for a long time, there's going to be something in you that says there's not a chance that that is true. Do it anyway. That's the power of intention. You do it anyway. You just give it a shot. So you repeat the new belief daily. Again, the more healing there is to be done, the more wrong the new affirmation is going to feel. It's just going to feel completely wrong. That's when you know you're actually onto something, believe it or not. Uh, so repeat the new belief daily, feeling as if it were true. Try to get yourself psyched up for that. Practice it every day. Just choose one for 30 days and see what changes blossom within and around you. In the world of matter as energy, we do indeed. We have the old adage reversed. We'll see it when we believe it. We'll see it when we believe it. So try it for yourself. And in closing, A couple takeaways for you. Use mindfulness. Use meditation and affirmations, these techniques that are extraordinarily powerful. Use them. They're invaluable practices for a deeply fulfilling and a deeply connected life. I caution and remind all of us to remember that the highest potential of meditation, just the highest potential of what it can offer, if we don't particularly want it in any given time, fine, but just remembering what it can give is the experience of oneness and interconnection, which sounds so abstract. But anyone in here who's meditated knows that feeling of just complete, utter spaciousness. 
It is wonderful that science is beginning to assert that everything is connected, including our minds and hearts, but until this understanding becomes our direct experience, direct experience, this knowledge can only take us so far. I'm gonna close with um, a, a wonderful uh, comment that my own teacher gave me when I really needed it, a bit of a kick in the butt. If you write honey on a piece of paper, she said to me, me personally, <laughs> you will not experience its sweetness, right? So we can read about these studies, we can go to lectures, great, as long as it inspires and empowers us to actually put some of this into practice in our own lives. And let's prove that this new science is real in the most important way possible in the laboratories of our own hearts and minds. I want to thank each of you for being here, and um, I'm happy to take any questions or comments.